So let's uh, let's read our passage first from Psalm 120, and then let's see what we can dig out of it that'll be useful for us today. So it says this. I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you, and what more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So what is this? A bit of an introduction to this psalm, and then we'll talk about its contents. First of all, where are we? Well, this is the first of the what's a, what are called the Psalms of Ascent. Those are Psalms 120 to 134, 15 psalms. And they were sung by pilgrims as they went from where they lived to Jerusalem at one of the great festivals, at least three major festivals of the year. The Jewish people were meant to go from where they lived up to Jerusalem to join in the festival. Sometimes if family units would travel together, sometimes even a small whole village might travel together in pilgrimage, of often long distances, camping overnight and being a, a family uh, on the move up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple at one of the big uh, uh, festivals. And so they would uh, sing through these Psalms, 120 to 134, as they went up to Jerusalem. And it's a uh, metaphorical ascent and a physical ascent because Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem was the highest city on the mountain uh, in Israel. And so wherever you were coming from, you'd end up higher at the end of your journey than when you began. So there's something also metaphorical there spiritually where you're journeying from somewhere lower to somewhere higher, somewhere more perhaps ordinary or distant from God to somewhere close to God as you're going to the temple and the Holy of Holies. Now, of course, we know, and the Jews knew, at least in theory, that God was everywhere, but there is still something intentional here expressed by these Psalms of going from a place not quite so close and intimate with God to somewhere closer uh, with God. So that's kind of the idea behind these uh, Psalms of Ascent. They're Psalms of pilgrimage, God's people journeying together to be close to God. And I think that might be useful for us right now. As you may know, I've started a podcast series on these, a daily podcast, to help us just to process what's going on uh, with the COVID-19 virus and all the challenges with that, but to keep our eyes and hearts focused on the Lord, like it says in Colossians, and set your hearts and minds on things above, Colossians 3, verses 1, 2, 3, or 4. And so we're journeying together. We don't know how long this journey will take, uh, to be honest, but at least if we journey together with God on this pilgrimage, and good things can come from it for us spiritually, because God is with us on this pilgrimage. We're not alone. And we know that, and it's good to be reminded of that. So that's the background. Now let's talk about a few things from this uh, psalm. I have three uh, points, if you like. And the first is, if we're going to do, if we're going to be spiritually healthy through a time like this, we need to call on God. And that is what the psalmist does. At the very beginning, he writes, I call on the Lord in my distress. It's not over in my distress. And he answers me, save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. He's in a tough place. Some people speculate that this might have been King David when he was being slandered by his opponents who wrote this. He's being honest. One of the key things to get us through a time like this is to be honest with God. In our prayers, if you're in despair, if you really are at your wit's end, be honest with God. The psalmist is. He's, he's, he's distressed. The word distress here in the Hebrew is the word sarah, which is the word used of a mother having their first child, the labor involved in that first delivery. It's that kind of agony, if you like. It's also a word used in the scriptures of the terror felt by people when they know that there is a rapacious army coming to conquer them and devour them and take everything they have and rape and pillage. It's that kind of terror. And so this is not like, I called to the Lord because I was a bit miserable or I had a bit of a bad headache. 
he's pretty desperate. And I know for myself and for a lot of us, as we've been talking the last uh, few days, some of us really feel that sense of almost terror. And it's not wrong to feel that. What wouldn't be so helpful is to feel it and not talk to God about it. So let God know how you're feeling. Be honest with him and be specific about how you're feeling. He talks about he's distressed. And then he says, oh, by the way, the key issue here is it's the lying lips and the deceitful tongues. He's being badly slandered. So be honest with your feelings. Whatever that is, let God know. That's the first thing about calling on God with honesty and with and with faith. We notice here that he's uh, calling to the Lord, Yahweh. Um, he calls to the Lord and he says, save me, Lord. And I like the progression. In verse one, it's I call to the Lord, like a propositional statement, like I know about him and I will call to him because he answers my prayers. But then the second verse is more personal. Save me, Lord. Now he's addressing the Father, but God directly. So sometimes that's our prayers, isn't it? We start with something we know to be true about God, and then we're able to make it personal. So perhaps that's something for us to think about in our times of quiet with God uh, at, at a time like this. I like the fact that he refers to the fact that he knows that God answers him. He answers me. And so what he's doing there is I think he's reflecting on past answer prayers, that God has been with him in the past. Perhaps if it was David when he fought Goliath, or when he was in a, a pit on a snowy day and had to defeat um, a lion. And those earlier times he saw prayers answered. Again, at a tough time like this, it's, it's really helpful to think back to when you had prayers answered, maybe even going back to when you became a Christian. God was looking out for you. God brought the right people into your life at that time. And you prayed around about that time and you, you asked God for help and he gave it to you. So let's not forget that God has already answered many of our prayers and he will answer the prayers we offer now. What else could we talk about? Oh, one other thing is that this word distress, the Sarah word, is also used in Proverbs 17 and verse 17 when it says, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity or a time of sarah, a time of distress. And so what he's saying there is the Proverbs are reminding us that also we need each other. We are brothers and sisters together who need each other in our time of sarah. In our distress, we need each other. Now, of course, we are socially distancing. It's the responsible thing to do. And we're not able to see each other in the way that we would like. But that doesn't mean we can't offer each other uh, support and love. And I want to encourage us to remember to not only pray for each other, but to be in touch. This is the time to make the most of the amazing resources we've been given with online resources and, and phones. Be in touch and perhaps particularly use the video facilities. Use the, uh, the video facilities of FaceTime or WhatsApp uh, or whatever we want to use. There is something different about seeing people's faces, not just hearing their voices. Penny, Penny taught her mom how to use the video facility on WhatsApp this week because she can't physically go and see her. And it made a huge difference to Penny's mom to actually see Penny's face. And so let's think about that uh, as we uh, try to be an encouragement to each other in our times of distress. So point number one, let's call on God from verses one and two there. Now, moving on. Verse 3 and verse 4. I hope you're all still with me because I'm not getting any feedback here. I'm guessing you're all still paying attention and you haven't all gone off to Netflix at this point. Uh, but if you, by the way, want to ask a question, drop it in the chat box or make a comment there if you want to. Second point, trust God. Verses 3 and 4. What will he do to you? Now, he's talking about what God will do to those who lie and slander him. What will he do to you? What more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with the warrior's sharp arrows and burning coals of the broom bush. Trusting God. We need to trust God for wisdom. There's one of the things that happens at a time like this is things are thrown up in the air. We can't see exactly where it's going, how it's all going to turn out. What do we do? One of the things we do is we ask God for the wisdom to, to discern between the things that we need to pay attention to and the things that don't matter. We need to pay attention to scientific issues, to government advice, to things like that. 
but we must not pay attention to Satan's lies. And this is something for us to think about, is what are we listening to it from the media that's wise to listen to and not to? And what are we listening to even within our own mind that's wise to listen to and pay attention to, and that which it is not wise to listen to and pay attention to? See, God has things under control. The psalmist believes that God will sort it out. He leaves his revenge or vindication in God's hands. God will sort out the deceitful tongue. God will sort out the, the liars. We need to have faith in God that he will sort things out. It may not be easy, may not be pleasant, but he will sort it out. Satan is a liar. I mean, he's lying. He wants, to, he wants you and I to believe things about God that are not true. Let me quote to you from a book called Life Without Lack by Dallas Willard, where he talks about what Satan's trying to do. He says this, a little bit long, but hang with me. If we are to know the abundant provision of God's unlimited resources, we must also understand how Satan works to rob us of that experience. He does so by deceit. You may have heard the saying that the way to know if certain people are lying is if their lips are moving. This is absolutely true of Satan. Jesus referred to him as a liar and the father of lies, John 8 verse 44. Indeed, his whole kingdom is based on lies. He works by deceiving. Why? Because he does not have direct power over our will. Therefore, if he is to get us to do his bidding, he has to fool us. He cannot make us do anything we do not want to do. If it is true that a person can be the devil's puppet, the strings are Satan's lies. It might be important to consider what some of the lies are that we would be tempted to believe at a time like this. I would suggest the lie that God doesn't care, the lie that God is distant, the lie that God is not has not got your best interest and my best interests at heart, the lie that uh, we are alone in this, or the lie that we are stuck and we cannot make progress spiritually, the lie that you think, uh, the lie that comes into your mind that I cannot cope. I cannot cope with the isolation. I cannot cope with the uncertainty. I cannot cope with knowing what might happen to my elderly relatives or my children or my friends. This, this, these are all lies of Satan. I'm not saying it'll be easy, but it's important we don't believe that Satan's lies. He wants you to get an eye, to get so panicked that we forget that we have God as our great resource and we can trust him and rely on him. The psalmist does not try and take matters into his own hands and deal with the liars. He trusts that God will deal with it. The, um, the image he uses here, images are interesting. He says they'll be punished with a warrior's sharp arrows and the burning coals of a broom bush. Now, it may not sound like much, but the point I think he's making is the weapons of his enemies are just their tongues. That's, you know, that, that, that's all they've got. They've got a tongue. He says, you're going to be defeated by God's sharp arrows. Now, I'd rather face a tongue than a sharp arrow if that was the weapon. And you're going to be defeated by the burning coals of the broom bush. The broom bush was used for charcoal in that culture. So he's talking about red hot charcoal. That's, that's how God's going to deal with your tongue, you evil person who's slandering me. So God's resources are more powerful than the resources of our enemy. And our enemy is not the virus. Our enemy is Satan's lies, trying to tempt us not to trust God and not hold on to him. So don't believe the lies. You need God's, you know, to trust God for wisdom and when you trust God for strength. So that's our second point. Third and final point before we take communion. What does the psalmist do after he's laid out his needs and he has decided to trust God? After that, he turns to God more specifically, I would say. In verse 5, woe that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. What is he talking about here? What is Meshech and Kedar? So Kedar was the area to the east of the Jordan, the, the sort of wilderness on the east side of the Jordan, way over east. And Meshech, we think, was might have been Asia Minor or Turkey these days, so way up in the north. And he's saying, oh, woe that I live so far away in the north, or woe that I live so far away in the east. 
Well, he can't literally be in both places, of course. He's not actually talking about literally living in those places. He's talking about metaphorically feeling like he is so far away from Jerusalem, from the holy city, from the temple, from God. He feels like he's so far away. Maybe he's saying, I'm homesick. I want to be with the Lord instead of in this mess. Maybe he's saying, I'm tired of being surrounded by the pagans in Meshech and in, in Kedar. I don't want to be with the pagans. I don't want to be in this world anymore. There's an old hymn along those lines. I don't want to be in this world anymore. Maybe you feel like that. I've had enough of this mess. I've had enough of this confusion, enough of this fear. I want to be home with the Lord. I want to be there. I think he's expressing what we often feel, which is, I've had enough. Can we go home now, please? And so I think he's feeling rather, rather like that. And and then he says, I've, I've too long I've lived among those who hate peace, the, the shalom word here. And perhaps what's happening in his heart is he's recognizing he's been surrounded by this worldly situation. And now he needs to more deliberately turn his attention to God in, in a sense, repentance. And this, remember, this is the first psalm. It's the beginning of the pilgrimage. He's beginning his pilgrimage saying, I need to get my heart and mind in the right place to have this pilgrimage to be with God. And maybe for us, as we reflect on the way that the virus situation is affecting our spirits, it's a good time to think about, maybe I need to repent of some things. I don't necessarily mean some heinous sin, but maybe it's time to repent of the way we've been viewing God. Maybe it's a time to re reprioritize our times of quiet with God. I know some of us have been talking about that, to pray more with one another, even if it is only over the phone. To, to set more time aside for spiritual reading and prayer. You might be having a bit more spare time. Then maybe this is a time to do that. And God is not, God hasn't brought us the virus to make us think differently about prayer, but perhaps as the virus has arrived, it's a time for us to think differently about those times of quiet with God. So I would suggest that we focus more on the peace that's available than the war that we're in. I think that's what he's doing. These people love war. I love peace. We love peace. We will only find peace when we deliberately approach God for that peace. Peace is available. I've been struggling with it, to be honest. I mean, I, I go out to pray and I've been praying every day, but I have found it more difficult recently to connect with that, that sustaining power of God than, than usual. And I have my mind crowded with all kinds of thoughts, like all of us, I'm sure. And I've been you know, working out how to do stuff like this online here, Thames Valley, a lot of things there, my own parent situation. We've all got, I feel like I'm normally spinning quite a lot of plates. It feels to me like the number of plates I'm spinning has doubled or trebled all of a sudden. And I am finding it difficult to be as much at peace with God as I often, sometimes am and I'd love to be. Uh, pray for me, but let's pray to, to find that peace again. God can give us a peace the world doesn't understand. What's that verse in John 14? Peace I leave with you, Jesus says. My peace I give you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Or Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These are verses to to trust in and to rely on and to pray through so that we can experience this peace. Now, we're going to take communion in a moment, but what I'd like to do before that is read a passage from Ephesians chapter 2 that I think will be very helpful, which also talks about the peace that's available. And the peace we have is not a self-manufactured peace. It's not created by us. It's a peace that's been brought to us by Jesus by his sacrifice on the cross. And that's why we have peace. And that cross reminds us that no virus has the victory. No fear has the victory. No crisis has the victory. Jesus has the victory because he has already conquered sin and death. And it's that that we're going to rest in and celebrate as we take the bread and wine. I want to thank Penny for organizing bread and wine here or cracker and, and some wine some nice uh, white wine homebrew actually here. So I'm going to take that in a minute with all of us together. But let me read first from Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 
12 to verse 18. And let's, let's, I'll read this and let's meditate on it. Then I'll pray and then we'll take bread and wine. We've got a great God. Let's, let's read this. Ephesians 2 verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that we have you on this pilgrimage through life. And this pilgrimage through our lives, we know sometimes has its easier sections of the path, but sometimes it has its more difficult periods. And this feels like one of the most difficult most of us will ever have experienced. We pray, Father, we pray, Father, that as we go through this very difficult period, you please help us to have trust in the faith, trust in your power and strength and wisdom. Help us not to believe the lies of Satan. Help us to, to be honest with you. Help us to have meaningful times of quiet with you, which bring your peace into our hearts. We thank you so much for Jesus, and we know that it's only because of him that we have any peace with you. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross and that he has devoid, he has de, 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 he has destroyed the barrier between us and you. And he has provided us with peace in this life and peace in the next. We pray as we take this bread and wine that you'd use it to strengthen our remembrance of what Jesus has done for us and to fill us with trust in you for the days ahead. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his body broken and his blood that was shed, and we take this now in his name. Amen.